Welcome everybody to the Legends of March Madness on the Grilly Truth Sports Network. I'm your host for the Legend of March Madness, Mike Goodpaster. And tonight we're going to talk about the 1953 Indiana Hoosiers led by the legendary coach Branch McCracken. Now a lot of people don't think Indiana basketball really mattered until 1971 when Bob Knight got there. But that's simply not true. If you've seen the movie Hoosiers and you know the story of Milan, Oscar Robertson, you know that Indiana was a hotbed of basketball, always has been, and probably the apex of that was in the 1950s. And in the 1950s, what you had was, number one, the 53 Hurry and Hoosiers, who win the national championship, a one-point win over Kansas. Uh, 1953 also is the year Little Milan High School went to the Final Four. 1954, Milan goes back again, wins a national championship. The interesting thing there is in the regional finals, to go to the Final Four, they beat Oscar Robertson and Chris Posadics. Now, Chris Posadics was an all-black school from Indianapolis. The next year, 55 and 56, Oscar Robertson would lead Chris Posadics to back-to-back -back state championships, becoming the first all-black team to win the Indiana State High School Basketball Championship, and also the first team from the city of Indianapolis to win it. So when you put in Branch McCracken, Bobby Plump, Marvin Wood, and the Milan Indians, um, Chris Posadics and Oscar Robertson, the heyday of basketball in the state of Indiana to me is the 1950s. Now, the 1953 Hoosiers barely beat DePaul in the first round, won by a point. They went 17-1 and one in the Big Ten that year to win the Big Ten championship, and they would play Kansas. Kansas is a team that 13 years before, in 1940, the Hoosiers won their first national championship, and they won it relatively going away by like 20, 22 points. Now, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to take you back in time to March the 19th, 1953. The game was on the 18th, but this article was written by George Bollinger, from the Daily Herald Telephone in Bloomington. The title is again, or is, Back Home Again in Indiana. When I read this to you, you know that times were a little different back then, and I don't want people to take these as my words. These are all George Bollinger. I may add some stuff here or there, but here we go. Kansas City, March 19th. The Indiana University's battling hurrying Hoosiers whom Coach Branch McCracken once admitted might win a few games this season, and whom the Esperks said were a year away from greatness, today ruled the entire domain of college basketball, wearing their second in history National Collegiate Athletic Association crown. The Hoosiers, who recently took the champ out of Champaign in defeating Illinois for the Big Ten title, the first step towards the covet of NCAA honors. Now, remember, back then, these are my words, you had to win the conference to be able to even qualify for the NCAA tournament. So, last night took Kansas out of Kansas City. As they edged the run-and-steal Jayhawks by the slimmest of margins, 69-68, to to duplicate a finals victory over Kansas that had brought them their first national championship in 1940. The setting was the same in beautiful municipal auditorium. But the score was vastly different. Indiana won the first one in 1940 by a decisive 60-42. to This time, the legendary coach Fogue Allen, Fog Allen, who claimed his team was living on borrowed time, didn't see his credit run out until the last possible second when a game-ending shot by Jayhawk sh sub Jerry Alberts fell a few inches short. Indiana's only three defeats of the year had come by a combined margin of five points in eight seconds, and Hoosier hearts, some 350 strong, were in Hoosier throats as the Alberts cut loose. Some of the loyal IU followers haven't swallowed yet. Now when the ball ricocheted from the near edge of the rim as the final horn sounded, pinup emotion broke loose on the IU bench. Players hugged their teammates and literally crawled over each other to reach McCracken, the big sheriff who had once captured the big one and returned with the loot. As in nearly all contests this year, Indiana was led by its great sophomore, Don Schlunt. But this one was more of a team victory than any game along the line. Now, Schlunt totaled 30 points, including 9 of IU's 10 in the last period. 
For those that don't know, my words again, they used to play four periods, not two halves in 1950s. But Bobby Leonard canned a winning free throw, as well as 11 other points. Charlie Crack turned in the greatest game of his career when it was needed most. Burke Scott was a dervish all over the floor and contributed six vital points early. And Dick Farley came up with his usual great but ensuing performance on both offense and defense. Now, the headline here to caption is subs play a big role. A quartet of subs spelled the starters, especially when the threat of too many fouls got Indiana into trouble early in the game. In each, Dick White, Phil Byers, Jim D. Keen, and Paul Poff contributed a healthy share to the slim victory. It's hard to estimate the value of crowd support, but I use comparatively tiny following never let the Hoosiers feel that they weren't back to the hilt. The 350, augmented by the few other non-Kansas fans here, did the job of 10 times their number. The pressure was all on Indiana, the nation's number one team, the pregame favorite and the object of scorn by the partisan crowd. The pressure told two, with the Hoosiers being assessed three technical fouls for futile bursts of temper over what they considered unjust decisions. Kansas overturned or converted two of the technicals into points and received possessions of the ball twice, scoring baskets each time. But when all the returns were in, it was in the end on top by the small but ever so final margin of a point. The disinterested spectator, and there were a few here, couldn't have asked for a more dramatic game. The score was tied 14 times, Indiana led 10 times, the Jayhawks were in the lead 9 times. Indiana's longest lead was only 3 points. The Hoosiers trailed by as much as 6 points and several other times were 5 and 4 in arrests. The game was packed with great plays and great playing. Crack surprised the Jayhawks with his offensive work as he grabbed 12 points in the first half. Working with finesse beneath the basket, he scored a layup and two tip-ins and added six free throws as he drew Jayhawks into five fouls. Leonard absolutely chilled everyone in the auditorium with a last-second shot from mid-court to end the third period that arched tremendously high above the floor, then zipped through as the horn sounded. Kansas had held the ball for almost a minute before shaking A.H. A- H- Bourne loose for a basket with seven seconds left. Leonard nullified that with his towering effort. The Jayhawks' Dean Kelly earned his all-tourney berth on his defensive job against Leonard. He held him to a lone basket in the first, first half, and Leonard hit nine points in the third period, but trailed off to a free throw in the last ten minutes. As fate would have it, Dean Kelly fouled Leonard on the game-deciding play, and it was only a second foul to contest. It was only Leonard's second free throw. Alan Kelly, Dean's younger brother, played the part in the Kansas attack the crack played in Indiana's. He hit four baskets in the initial period, later adding 12 more points for a surprising total of 20. The main thing at this game, as expected, was a scoring duel between Schlunt and Bourne. The Kansas star collected 25 in the first three periods, then was held to a free throw in the fourth, before fouling out with 536 remaining. This was a crippling blow to the Jayhawks, but they hardly showed it. Schlunt, who had missed four and a half minutes of the second period, had 21 in the first three quarters and the first nine IU points in the fourth. His total of 30 gave him 123 for the four NCAA games, an average of 30.8 per game. Schlunt also established a free throw record for four games, cashing 49 as compared to Clyde, Lavelle, uh, Clyde Lavellet's 35 last year. IU made a team free throw mark for four games, collecting 108 to top to 80 made by Illinois last year. And IU posted a total score of 310 points, snapping to 307 made by Washington this year, which would have been 1953. That was done earlier in the night in the consolation tilt, as a lot of you guys know, <coughs> up until the late 70s, early 80s, they actually would play a third place game. I think they stopped doing it right around 1981, 82. All right. Um, so what you had here was you had an Indiana team that was young that nobody really expected to be that good that fast. And led by Don Schlunt. They were a team that really superseded or 
they went beyond the expectations of what people expected of them because everybody thought this would be a year later. Everybody knew it was a great team, but nobody knew that it could be done that quickly. So what happens in a year they were supposed to be good? That would be the 1954-55 season. And they were 8-14. and 14. Now, this was the team that was supposed, or no, 1954-55, they were 8-14, and 14, I think. I think I've got my numbers mixed up here, so I apologize for that. But l let's look it up real quick, because I, I know what the other team did, because I'm getting ready to interview one of the players that was on that team. The 53-54 Hoosiers went 20-4. and four. Um, They finished 12-2 and two in the conference, and as Big Ten champions, were invited to participate in the NCAA tournament, where they ended up losing their first game. So they lost to Notre Dame 65-64 to by a point. They ended up third in the regional, which then had a consolation also, as they beat LSU 73-72. So they lose to Notre Dame by a point the year that they were supposed to be great. They were pretty damn good, but they were nothing like the 1952-53 Indiana Hoosiers. Branch McCracken would go on to coach, I think, another five or so years. He won those two national championships, never won another one. The IU basketball program wasn't terrible after the 54 team, but what you got to remember is limited number. You had to win your conference. The Big Ten was tough, and it was hard to pull it out there, so... I just wanted to bring the story up of an Indiana Hoosier National Championship team that wasn't coached by Bobby Knight, that's a little bit less known, and to just talk a little bit about what Indiana high school basketball meant when it was one class, and you had all between 1953 and 1956, you had the Milan Indians with Bobby Plump, Marvin Wood, Ray Kraft, you had the 53-54 Indiana Hoosiers who won the national championship. And then you had Oscar Robertson who won back-to-back -back titles with Christmas Addicts. So, today, that's our March Madness story. Look out for future stories here over the next couple weeks since there's no NCAA tournament, which really has me bummed out. Um, working on an interview with Roosevelt Chapman, who was the leader of the 1984 Dayton Flyers, who were a Cinderella team that made it all the way to regional finals before losing to Patrick Ewing in Georgetown. So keep an eye out, hopefully for that. We are in contact with him, trying to get him. But I want to remind you guys, you can follow me at Grilling Truth. You can hear all of our shows wherever you find podcasts, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify. But for now, I'm Mike Goodpass, you've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.